Rick Rinell is joining us, the acting, uh, former acting director of national intelligence, our senior advisor for national security and foreign policy. Rick, I, I want to just read it for you because this is the part that we're looking at even legally at the ACLJ because they, they talk about the convergence of following factors has increased the volatility, unpredictability, and complexity of the threat environment here in the United States. Point number one, the proliferation of false or misleading narratives which sow discord or undermine public trust in the U.S. government institutions. I mean, Rick, you do a lot of media every day. You're critical of the Biden administration. We're going to talk about Iran in a minute. We're critical of their their position. Under that definition, are you undermining the U.S. government institutions by questioning their roles, and now that is treated as potentially an act of terrorism? Look, I have to be blunt. This is what fascist governments do. They try to shut down dissent. They try to take away the opposition's voice. They try to silence their critics. And this is exactly what's happening. They're trying to label any opposition, any critic, any criticism as a terrorist act. Now, look, I have to tell you that that we've spent the last decade, 15 years, having the media focus on government talk and policies that politicize intelligence. This is politicizing intelligence. Avril Haines, the director of national intelligence, should have never allowed this to come forward because what this is now doing is having a chilling effect on anyone who wants to speak out against the United States government. It's a scary moment. And as someone who worked at the State Department for over a decade, this is the exact type of of, uh, moves that the State Department usually calls out in other countries when other governments do this. Yeah, because they, they've defined it really they, as mis, dis, and malinformation. They got a new government acronym, MDM. But, you know, this idea, again, and they, they, they compare foreign and domestic threat actors for speech. What they don't define is that this is, this is not like speech that says uh, to re- truly just undermining the U.S. government. But you can imagine how, in this definition, how generally this is written, that by being critical of the commander-in-chief of that U.S. government or questioning their decisions. uh, And by the way, in the United States, you you have the right to believe in theories that that maybe aren't true and that maybe they want to call conspiracy theories. But putting that aside, the way the definition is written is not just for people who are trying to, like, take down the U.S. government, but it's just questioning the U.S. government and its leaders. Look, you, you protect speech that you don't like. And, and that's one of the basic principles of government. We have a Democratic Party that we've watched silent, silence critics. I mean, look at conservatives not being able to go on college campuses because they get shouted down and called hate speech. When I was a fellow at Carnegie Mellon, uh, there were a whole crowd of liberal teachers, progressive teachers and students, who said that they couldn't be in my presence because I was a threat to the truth. Now, this is a a really unbelievable moment because I also have to say, Jordan, it is atrocious to see the way our media is handling this in Washington, D.C. They are the group of people that are for tolerance and diversity, at least they've been in the past. People who allow dissent and don't shout down dissent, but look what's happening. The government, the ruling party, and the media are all working together to silence critics. And this happens all the time, and it seems like there always is a distraction. You, you saw you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene messed up a word, and all of a sudden, that's the story. The story isn't what she was reporting on, uh, which is a real issue. It was, oh, this silly, almost comedic version of what the actual news is. And Rick, when you talk about going to college campuses, you're not welcome there. Uh, you go to Hollywood, not welcome there. There is part of you where you have to fight back. You have to figure out ways to still make waves in these institutional issues, because if not, then you're just accepting the fact that your fate has been sealed. And how do we do that? I think that's part of the organization. Part of what we do here is to actually fight back against uh, things, not just take it, make you angry about it and leave it at that. We do have to come up with solutions. Well, I I love what um, Jordan was just saying before about how we are looking at this language from DHS, the directive that they uh, sent out. And by the way, I'll tell you, I got sent this directive immediately by a whole bunch of people who are career officials inside the uh, 
the administration inside working for the U.S. government, and they were horrified. They knew it immediately. They could see this chilling effect. So I'm glad that we're going to take a look at it. People should support the ACLJ yeah. so that we can do this type of work. We can hire attorneys and push back and make sure that this doesn't happen again. Yeah, because the way it works, you know, usually with the courts, is you'd say, does this government policy lead to silencing of speech in America? And if it does, it should be unconstitutional. We have to look at all the kind of how this all works together to see if it's actionable that way in court. Uh, because, again, it's a, one thing to put out a bulletin. It's another to say, do they have an actual action item connected to it? But I think, Rick, if you were one of those author authoritarian governments, you'd copy and paste this language into your own uh, into your own terrorism units. That is what is really troubling to me as someone who watches uh, international affairs very closely is the message that the Biden administration just sent to dictatorships and others around the world is that you can push the limit of silencing speech, call it dis or misinformation, silence your critics, or at least have a chilling effect on them. I wanted to ask you, Rick, I want to pivot a little bit to Iran because I didn't have a chance to talk to you about it yet this week. So there was a briefing by you, to U.S. Senators by uh, Rob Malley, who is the lead negotiator for the, the U.S. trying to get back into the Iran deal. And we had a, a, a lot of senators, they left that. They were horrified. Uh, they were. They said it was downright scary. Democrat senators, Bob Menendez, questioning why are we even talking anymore about trying to get into a nuclear deal? But there were more, and and what the report was is that Iran. This is from our the U.S. government telling the U.S. senators is two months or less away from having enough u enriched uranium to have a bomb. We don't know how long they are away from having a, a actual. Some reports said a year or less to, to a missile that can deliver that that bomb. Uh, but again, the idea that Democrats walked out of that too, just shaking their head, saying, "What? What is your plan here?" Because it doesn't seem like even if they let you back into the deal, that this is that that we can stop this anymore unless we take some other significant actions. We need to thank Senator Menendez, a New Jersey Democrat, for speaking out because he he was very forceful and he was very concerned. And I will say that Senator Menendez has done a good job of watching Iran and being uh, someone who, who sounds the alarm early within the Democratic Party. So we thank him for that. But the, the concern that I think we all have is that when you take the pressure off the international sanctions, you know, we in the Trump administration have done a good job of making Iran a pariah state. Uh, other countries didn't want to work with them. They didn't want to trade with them. They recognized what they were doing. Now that we've taken that pressure off and the sanctions uh, are clearly going to be lifted and we've told the Europeans that we're not watching it so closely anymore. Now that that has happened, we see a belligerent and a, an aggressive Iranian regime. They are on the offense. They're trying to get more money. And my concern is, is that the Biden administration looks to consensus with the Europeans rather than what's best for America. They're willing to water down our policy to please the Europeans and have this phony unified position. The concern we should all have is that the Germans and the French and others in Europe do not share the same threat assessment that we do with Iran. And so we should not be saying we can have the exact same policy because we view Iran very differently than they do. No, it seems like the only way Iran would even pause some of this, if you're actually going to trust them, is what you said, Rick, which is the pallets of cash. They, even sanctions relief, not enough for them. They, their foreign minister came out and said, words great, sanctions relief, okay, but no, we want, we want something deliverable hard. That's We know they're talking about cash. Rick, as always, we appreciate your insight on both of these issues. Thanks for joining us.